Okay, I'm going to be honest. Uh, this is the, well, I don't know how many times that I've tried to record this thing. Uh, this one's a little bit hard. I thought the other two were difficult. No, this one's, this one's different. Okay. Paradigm change, transition, part five. The water was warm and comforting, but my mind and heart were cold, chaotic, and in a state of despair. As I soaked in the tub, my soul was crying out to God for some kind of relief, some kind of hope. My music was interrupted by the phone ringing. I looked at the name, silenced the phone, and broke down in tears. It was one of my best friends, but I couldn't bear to answer. I'm a failure. I'm no good. I couldn't convince one person. Only two people from my church even reached out to me to study. I, I can't be a minister. I suck. This sucks. I'm through. Lord, help me. The phone started ringing again. It was another minister friend. Silenced. I can't face them. They see through me. They know I'm a fake. I'm a fraud. No good. God, why? I can't explain it. But in those moments of darkness, it was like physically impossible to answer the phone if it was anything related to church or ministry. My best friend in all the world sent me texts, tried to call me, and I didn't answer, and, and I, I haven't heard from him since. I just can't even put into words how awful it feels when I reflect on those days. The darkness, the despair, the pain, it's unimaginable. Thinking about it caused me to slip back into the darkness momentarily, but I believe it's worth it because if just one person that is, is in that stage... I want them to hear my story of transition. I want them to know that it gets better. I had this happen to me two major times. I'm talking months at a time. The fall of 2017 and the fall of 2018. Both times I cut off all contact with my church friends, stopped reading, stopped writing, and went into a major slump. But there have been many of these minor times throughout the years. Times when I've lost all hope. Thankfully, I've discovered the tools needed to help me uh, pull out of it before it gets too bad. And, and some of these I'll discuss later in a different post. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. The first four posts, I sat down, wrote in about an hour, and I never stopped typing. I mean, it was like that. This one has been different. After taking a little break, I'm ready to start again. And I want to tell you that so that you know that even though it gets better, it's not an instant fix. It will take time. For me, it is taking time even though it's been three years since the beginning of my transitional phase and my own paradigm change. All right, let's, let's get to it. In the fall of 2018, I was at a new congregation in southwest Florida. At the time, I was still drifting somewhere in the discontinuity and disembedding stage. But had you asked me where I was, I probably would have said stability. What I didn't know is that I was on top of a mountain, which was held up by my new ministry. But like a roller coaster, I was about to unexpectedly and suddenly plummet hundreds of feet. The thing about this process that I've laid out is that there are ebbs and flows. If it was, a, if it was static, then it would be a lot easier. But I believe that people tend to drift between the first three stages before setting out on the path of transition if they ever do. Once they're on that route, they, they still experience the drifting, as I do to this day, thanks to what Brian McLaren calls our, quote, inner fundamentalist. Thankfully, though, I believe the path is on a trajectory upwards. Whether or not it plummets again is yet to be seen. But I believe I am better equipped to handle it now than ever. At this new congregation, I studied quite a bit. I would sit at the beach and fly through books and papers. My friend Obi and I would talk on the phone often. One day, he wanted me to read a book called Velvet Elvis by Rob Bell. Laura will probably remember how I lay in the floor of her classroom reading in her, in her little reading nook while reading in the afternoons as she graded papers. I cuddled up with this, uh, this long caterpillar. It was like a pillow. Um, after I finished that book, I started another called Jesus Wants to Save Christians. I was a Christian that needed saving, and this book did just that for me. To be 100% honest with you, I didn't think too much of Rob or his first book. He didn't quote scripture the way I did, and the things he talked about made someone like me very uncomfortable, someone who likes to have black and white answers for everything. 
I was telling a friend of mine uh, the other day that if someone says both and one more time to me, I'm liable to go ballistic. <laughs> of course, that was my uh, inner fundamentalist talking. So what made me like Jesus Wants to Save Christians so much? Well, In the introduction, Rob writes, This book is our attempt to articulate a specific theology, a particular way to read the Bible, referred to by some as a New Exodus perspective. One New Exodus scholar is a British theologian named Tom Holland, who has done pioneering work in this approach. End quote. Tom Holland happens to be one of my favorite authors. His book, Contours of Pauline Theology, is one I refer back to regularly, and his commentary on Romans is a must-have, in my opinion. But this line in the introduction didn't make any sense to me. How can someone like Rob Bell, who I unfortunately viewed as somewhat biblically shallow, name drop someone like Tom Holland and dedicate an entire book to discussing his perspective? That's when it hit me. Something else is going on here. As I read that book, I began to see through the lines. I began to see the bigger picture. There was more to Rob than meets the eye. So Jesus Wants to Save Christians had a major impact on the way I view ministry. It also helped to put something into perspective, something a friend of mine tried to tell me years ago, something she probably didn't fully grasp at the time. Let me tell you, even though what she told me took a while to bring about change in her own life, the Spirit was working in her that day. We were talking and I was distraught. People just didn't get what I believed. But why is it so important? She asked. It's the truth. The truth is important, I replied. Look at that guy over there cutting grass, she said as she pointed to a man cutting grass without a shirt. Do you think he cares about prophecy? He needs Jesus, not a correct view of Revelation. She was part of the group that views everyone else as going to hell, so it's pretty safe to assume that he was too from that perspective. Uh, Jesus Wants to Save Christians is a book about two numbers. The back of the book says, There is a church in our area that recently added an addition to their building, which cost more than $20 million. Our local newspaper ran a front-page story not too long ago, revealing that one in five people in our city lives in poverty. They go on to write, It's a book about oppression, occupation, and what happens when Christians support, animate, and participate in the very things Jesus came to set people free from. As they outlined all the evils in the world, evils that are unfortunately supported by people claiming to be Jesus followers, it really put my faith into perspective. These debates and discussions about theology were and are important. But what does God care more about? When I began asking this question, God began giving me answers through the scripture. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Matthew twenty three twenty three. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Matthew five twenty three to 24 At that time, Jesus went to the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry? He and his companions, how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you will not have condemned the innocent. Matthew 12, 1-7 they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact the tribute of grain from them, though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. Amos five ten to 12 Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans thirteen eight through 10 But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. 
All the nations will be gathered before him, and he'll separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these uh, brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will say also to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then you will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it not to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew twenty five thirty one to 46 Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you store up your treasure. Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of, of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth. It's not Sabbath. Whoops, whatever. Okay. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. James 5, 1 to 6. My doctrine, my beliefs, my hours of study. What good were they doing when my neighbor was going hungry? What good are they doing when people are living in poverty? What good are they doing when I, God help me, when I was, um, all right, <clears throat> when I was almost joyful, knowing that I would never die in a mass shooting at a gay nightclub because I'm a heterosexual Christian, that I would never be uh, raped while drunk because I don't drink at bars. And I was so proud of this that I posted it on Facebook for all to see. Forgive me, Lord. Um, people fleeing their tyrannical government, children starving, parents risking their lives to give their kids a better life, innocent people dying in military conflict, injustice, terror, Death, destruction. But look at me. I figured out Revelation. God help me. I know how to interpret Matthew 24 better than my mom and dad. Yay me! Lord, forgive me. What has happened? I learned that my doctrinal disputes are nothing. Nothing in light of the pain and suffering in the world. This began a transformation of my priorities from doctrines to people, from being right to loving right, from tithing spices to focus on the weightier matters, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. This led to a major transition in my view of Christianity, fellowship, and the nature of God. Is someone who loves God with all their heart, loves their neighbor as themselves, but worships with an instrument really going to burn in hell forever or be annihilated? Is someone who loves God with all their heart, loves her neighbor as herself, but is a minister going to be rejected by God because she takes an active public role in the assembly? What kind of, what kind of God is that? Would I even want to serve that kind of God? Is that really who Jesus revealed God to be? God forbid. I think one reason we focus on these things is because doctrine is such a convenient escape from our call to be harbingers of justice. 
When we focus so much on patterns, methods, and beliefs, we can hide behind those discussions and conveniently neglect our duty to stand up to the empires of the world, to to fight to end poverty, to heal the sick, to visit the imprisoned, to clothe the naked, to speak out against materialism like Jesus did. And all these things Jesus did and they got him killed. But they got him raised. I get lots of negative comments and messages when I say that I can have fellowship with someone, like my friend Mike, who disagrees with me on baptism. But guess what? I would rather share Christian fellowship with someone who works with Narcotics Anonymous, helps the hungry, is constantly looking for ways to love his neighbor and his enemies, just like Jesus did, than be with someone who agrees with me doctrinally on paper, but condemns everyone who doesn't fit into our very specific mold. This, this transition was a transition of priority. My, mo- my new paradigm is one of, of action, not just beliefs. It's one of doing, not, not just thinking. I still love to study the Bible. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I believe it's a necessity. But I refuse to draw lines over doctrines unless those doctrines bring harm to those around them. If I can find someone who believes in Jesus and loves their neighbor, I can enjoy Christian fellowship with that person regardless of our doctrinal differences. How infinitely small they seem when there is so much work to be done. I imagine if we were so busy trying to live like Jesus, we wouldn't have time to fight about doctrines as much as we do. God help us. We need reformation. Which happens to be the next stage in paradigm change. (laughs) Oh man. Oh, Okay, that was tough. Thanks for bearing with me, folks. Um, DanielR.net if you're interested in more. God bless you all.